Excellent. Well, uh, it's good to be with all of you. Um, so um, as as uh, as Andy had said, uh, we had worked together before, and, and this really has become for me, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of a passion project um, to really see through uh, this whole process. And and um, I guess as we begin, you know, uh, kind of looking at this, you know, this is the, the unpacking Pope Francis's post synodal apostolic exhortation, Christus Vivit. Um, I've, not, I've got the book right here. I keep it with me at all times. Uh, it's an incredible resource. Um, but you probably, the first thing you probably uh, want to know is, uh, you know, what is a post synodal apostolic exhortation and why should we care about it? Um, you know, oftentimes, we don't get a chance to uh, to think about papal documents and think, oh my God, I can't wait to pull that off the shelf and read it. Um, maybe by the end of our time today, uh, maybe this might be um, your socially distant beach reading for the summer. Um, I think it's uh, incredibly, uh, it's an incredibly exciting thing. Um, this is perhaps Pope Francis's most personal document to date. Um, in it, you'll find some incredibly rich things, but you'll also get to know the person of Pope Francis. He really put himself into that. Now, kind of describe a little bit. So let's though get in. Like, what what is this all about? Why should we care? Um, I'm going to save the why should we care as we get into it. But first, let me tell you what it is, because it's like, okay, it's great you're talking to us, uh, but what is uh, a, a post synodal app? Well, the name itself, post synodal means that it's it's following a synodal journey. Um, this is a global process that began uh, in the wake of the Second Vatican Council. Um, I'm gonna do it a little bit, I'm not gonna do it justice, but in the shorthand, basically at Vatican II, the, 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 the council fathers said, you know what, getting together on a global scale to talk about the issues of the church was so good, we should do this every now and then. We should keep coming back together and with the Holy Father, uh, you know, come together to discuss key pastoral concerns of the church. Um, so Paul the Sixth, Saint Paul the Sixth, um, established uh, the synodal process. Um, and here's how it generally goes. Again, I am I am giving you the not official, you know, official language version. I'm giving you a very uh, easy to understand way to understand what a synodal process and what a post synodal process is all about. So a synod, in short, starts with a papal announcement. The Pope says, I want to talk about a key pastoral concern of the church. Then uh, each of the dioceses of the world do are invited to do consultation. They're invited to consult. They're invited, the, the bishops are consulted, and the bishops are invited to really explore that issue and uh, share their findings with the Holy See. Uh, then the Vatican compiles all that has been heard from around the world, and they come up with a working document, what's called an instrumentum laborum, uh, laboris, uh, the Latin word for working document. It sounds much better in the Latin than it does in the English, um, but it is essentially a document that takes all that was heard in different diocesan consultations, puts together in one document, so that for the Episcopal conversation, so bishops around the world come together to Rome and they take that working document and have a conversation around it and really kind of unpack it uh, with the bishops. After that's done, their conclusions after their conversation are given back to the Holy Father, who again made that initial papal announcement, and he then takes all that and he provides his response to that, and that becomes the apostolic exhortation. And so essentially that is what we have here. So um, in 20, so the 2017, 2019 period, there was a synodal journey uh, that took place. Um, in 2016, uh, Pope Francis uh, basically established that the theme of his 2017 to 2019 synodal journey would be young people, the faith and vocational discernment. Um, because it is a it is an expression of the church's pastoral care for the young. So this particular so, so what's important about it is that since the Second Vatican Council, since these synods have taken place, there have been many topics: evangelization, the scriptures, the family. 
but none yet on young people. And so this was the first time that young people were gonna be the focus of the synodal process. Um, and so what happened was in 2017, uh, the, there was in January, the Pope put out a, a, a preparatory document. Um, then the synod consultations began on a diocesan level, um, which is again, in keeping with the normal flow of how synods work. But then what, this is where things started to get a little different. And this is where I really believe Pope Francis really added in his Latin American perspective. As many of you know, the, the inquentral process in Latin America is a grassroots conversation and consultation with the faithful to really draw this up from the, the ground up. The synodal process is kind of a little bit, as established in Vatican II, it's a little bit top down. I mean, it's the Pope starts it, then the bishops have consultations, and it kind of stays at that level, which is why many of you probably have not heard of synods that often because it often stays at that level of church. But Pope Francis's Latin American roots meant that in, in order to have a true consultation, you have to start from the roots up. So you'll see elements in Pope Francis's synods on the family and on young people, the Amazon, uh, and everything that he's done around synods has involved this, this grassroots thing. So he wanted to have some symposia with ministers and researchers. Um, I was blessed um, to be part of one of those symposia at the Vatican where the ministers, the national coordinators were brought together. We were already there for a World Youth Day meeting, so he also wanted us to talk about uh, the synodal questions at that time. He also brought sociologists and researchers to the Vatican, again, bringing that, the, 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 the level of that uh, to the Holy See. And again, wanting to not just talk about young people, but talk to young people and with young people. Um, one of the ways Pope Francis says is, why don't, we, why don't we survey them? So there was a global online survey of youth and young adults that was done in 2017. Uh, they sent this link out to all the countries of the world and young people were invited to take part and to have the conversation online with some key questions. Um, so all of that was happening. So you can kind of start to see that there's an element of the Latin American inquentral process that's intersecting with this since Vatican II European synod process that's coming together here, that Pope Francis doesn't just want the bishops to do diocesan consultations, but he wants the faithful to be involved. He wants ministers, people like yourselves. He wants researchers. He wants the young people themselves to be part of the dialogue. Um, and I, I and partially, I don't know, maybe it's because he wanted to, he, maybe he got so excited hearing from the young people in the online survey, he wanted to draw the young people to the Holy, to, to, to the Holy See to have a conversation directly with them. So in 2018, in March, he had a pre-synod young adult meeting where he invited 300 young adults from around the world to meet with him in the synod office to literally tell him what was going on. Um, they also, as part of this, they also did uh, some Facebook and Twitter conversations that was managed by some of the young people at the, at the Vatican offices, and they were taking in feedback on social media, um, and then again, intersecting that with, with the live meeting of young people there. So um, again, this, is, this was unprecedented, um, that all this consultation was brought together, and then it goes back to the kind of the normal process where a working document was to get was developed in 2018, and then later that year in October, um, there was a four-week synod of bishops that was held in Rome. Uh, and this four-week process, I must say, four weeks at the Vatican where bishops were sitting in a room together. It's a long time. What it basically was is they spent the first three weeks kind of dissecting the working document, which was divided into three parts each week. They would take they would tackle a different part of the working document, which again had been de developed after hearing all of the things from 2017 and the early part of 2018. And then the last week was spent kind of, now that we've discussed it, let's put together our recommendations to the Holy See. And that's what happened in October. In 2019, I got to imagine that it, from, uh, from November through January of 2019, um, the Holy Father is is really dwelling on this and, and reflecting on it, praying on it, reflecting on his own past experience. And then he encounters young people in Panama for World Youth Day. So that's part, it's, it's, it's very providential 
that this event kind of lands right in the middle of Pope Francis's own discernment. And uh, and so and, and actually you can see it reflected in the final document because he 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 quotes himself from World Youth Day and he mentions the the impact of World Youth Day in the document. So it certainly had an element there. Um, and then in, and then in March of 2019 he promulgated Christus Vivit. Um, so so that's the journey that we had. And that I said this is the normal sense, but but there's some new things that this citadel journey brought to us. Um, the, 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 when the Synod Fathers were done uh, with their four weeks in Rome, they produced a final document. And this was one of the most impactful things they said. The church as a whole, when choosing through the Synod to concern herself with the young, took a very definite option. She considers this mission, the engagement of young people, a pastoral priority of epoch-making significance in which to invest time, energy, and resources. Epoch making significance. That's a, that phraseology, I think, to me, just excites me. It says that our work with the young is not just a, 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 an extracurricular activity of our ministries or our parishes, but it has the ability to shape the very age we live in. It is epoch making in its significance. Just take a reflection on that work. So many of you who work with young people uh, in your parishes, in your areas, know that what you do is a pastoral priority of epoch making significance. Take that perhaps, put that on your resume next time you, uh, you go into your pastor's office and say, hey, just by the way, I'm doing some epoch making significant work here. So I just want all of you to know that the work you do is that important. And the Synod Fathers were clear to point this out in which we have to invest our time, our energy, and our resources. And then it goes on to say, rural conferences, that's me, Andy used to work there, and particular churches, that means the diocese, um, uh, that's Elaine and Andy now, and, and, and all of you who work in the diocese, diocesan level, to continue this journey. So I applaud the Archdiocese of Atlanta for, for convening this, because you're continuing this journey. Um, to think about it this way, the other way of epoch making significance. So Christus Fibit is the first and only global magisterial document of the Catholic Church on youth and young adults. There is no other document of the universal church that has been written by the Holy See specifically on young people. So that is why it is incredibly significant because for those who work in this field, who those who want to, and actually in some respects, all of us work with young people in, in our personal lives, our families, our churches, uh, and, and we intersect with this generation, this document thus serves as a really big cornerstone for us. And so that's why it's significant. And that's one of the reasons why I'm excited to be able to share a little bit of this document with you. Um, I was so excited. Um, I got uh, one of the things I had the opportunity to do is actually have Pope Francis sign my copy of Christus Vivit. So um, yes, I was I was fanboying uh, when I went to the Holy See after it was released and totally said, can I have your autograph? Um, so usually most people give gifts to the to the Holy Father when they meet him. Um, I wanted my I wanted my gift back. Um, I said, thanks for signing it. Can I have that back? Now? Um, so I have a signed copy of Christus Vivit, which is one of my most treasured possessions. Um, and uh, it was incredible to really uh, walk with this journey. And, and, and part of my story, um, I worked with Andy, as he said, uh, on the synodal process. Um, I had the, the opportunity to listen firsthand to what was said in different diocesan consultations. Um, I was there to, uh, to watch the bishops and even the delegates to the pre-synod. I walked with them in their journey as well. So um, it, it was incredibly heartening for me to watch this firsthand, to see it go from conception uh, to development, uh, to promulgation, and then now the implementation of it. Um, so um, I, it's a very grace time for me. Uh, and, uh, and, and so that's been part of it. So, so what does this document say? This document is about young people. Um, and uh, so first of all, the first thing I wanna do is what do we mean by young people? And, I, and I'm, you'll see here that I've actually put not only the English, but the Spanish. Um, because by the way, I don't just carry one copy of Christus Vivid around, I actually carry two. Um, and if you look closely at your screen, you will note 
that my second copy of Christus Vivit is in Spanish, because that is what the Holy Father wrote this, the document in its original text. It was originally written in his mother tongue in Spanish. Um, and I think that's significant because, um, again, it's personal to him. Um, throughout the document, actually, if you look at the footnotes of the document, you'll find different people throughout Pope Francis's life that as a youth, as a young adult, that influenced him. His mentors are in the footnotes. His teachers, um, the his his youth ministers and young adult ministers are in the in the footnotes. He, you know, so you could tell that as he was developing this document, it had it was something that was personal to him, um, and so there's a certain connection there. So I will use in the in my explanation here. I'm going to reference some of the Spanish because I think it's also good for us to know uh, what it was, uh, how it was originally said. So he speaks of joveness or juventud, um, and he says in the document, in some countries, one tends to speak of young people in the plural. Uh, the age group considered by the synod does not represent a homogenous category, but is composed of several distinct groups, each with its own life experience. And I think it's important to put out that um, one, of the, one of the things that we should know that joveness is defined in the document as those 60 to 29 years of age. Um, now, there are various dimensions of what it means to be a young person in the United States, around the world. That's specifically who he's talking about. In the U.S. context, we use that to also describe youth and young adults. So um, that's two, two different groups. And so he speaks there about it's not homogenous. It's not one. Hovenus is not one giant group, but rather there are distinct elements of it. And I think that's one of the important things to remember when reading this document. Um, when looking through this document that the young people we're talking about um, is, is much vast, the, vaster than we might initially think. Um, and, and, and each of those groups have to be approached distinctly. Um, the other thing he really points out in the document is that you can't speak of young people in the abstract. Um, it's, it's very easy sometimes to fall into the temptation of speaking of those young people or these young people as if that all young people, when they think together, are this, uh, basically the same voting block or something like that. And you see this in our, in our media, you see this in our national conversations, often around elections, about the youth vote or the young adult vote. Um, people will speak about it as if all young people, for some odd reason, um, think the same way, have had the same life experience. They haven't. And each young person needs to be approached one by one and I think that's a valuable thing as we start into what this document says to remember that when we speak of young people, we speak of a collection of young persons, individual, one by one. So I guess at this time, what I would probably ask you to do as you think through this is I want you to think in your life, if you could name one, two, three young people, youth or young adults that you know, perhaps people that you minister with in your parishes, Think about people in your family, maybe um, a nephew, uh, a niece, maybe a son or daughter, maybe grandchildren, uh, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's somebody that, you know, and if you are a young adult, who else do you know beyond yourself? Uh, what is your, your, you know, your peer community? Think to yourself of those people, put those people in your mind. That is how Pope Francis wants us to approach young people in this document, not by thinking of them in the abstract, not by thinking of them like a church tagline of who do we have to recruit, but thinking of them as human beings, one by one. They are in the plural. And so as you go through, I just want you to keep those individuals that you've just thought of in your mind, in your mind. Now, the second part of, of what he means by hovenness is he says, Jesus himself eternally young, uh, once us, I have to move my, <laughs> my, my screen here first, wants to give us hearts that are ever young. As we mature, grow older, and structure our lives, we should never lose that enthusiasm and openness to an even greater reality. At every moment in life, we can renew our youthfulness. Now, what's important about this is that when we speak about young people, I ask you to think of those individuals who fall in that age range or youth or young adulthood. But I, if I gave all of you a mirror 
maybe in your screen right now, your your screen, you might see your reflection in the in that in that screen. That is also another young person because he challenges us to renew our youthfulness. So when he speaks of young people, he's not just speaking, um, he's not just speaking of a 21 year old. He's not just speaking of a 27 year old or a 16 year old. He's speaking to each of us. Um, each of us can renew our youthfulness. He talks about Jesus who is eternally young, in a sense wants to give us hearts that are eternally young. In fact, in order for us to be, one of the ways Pope Francis somewhat gets in this document is saying, if we want to be the best version of the Catholic Church, we need to approach our church as if we are young people. What do young people have? They are enthusiastic, they are bold, they are risk takers, they are not afraid to venture a little further down a certain path. They are advocates, um, they are open to others, they are compassionate, they are they are focused on um, the joys of life and all that life has to offer. And if we can approach the ch church, if we can approach the world like a young person, a youth or a young adult, then we can renew the church. So he's calling the church to be young again. And so when we speak about, this is a document on young people. Yes, I want you to think of somebody in their 20s perhaps, but I also want you to think about yourself. Think about how you can be youthful, because if I think if you approach this doc, then in a sense, this doc could theoretically apply to everyone. It could apply to the to the teenager, to the young adult. It could apply to the 70 year old, the 80 year old, the 90 year old, as long as they have renewed their youthfulness. One of the things he reflects on the doc, one little line he gives, and again, this is whether it's personal. He said that when he was when 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 he became pope. He was granted a renewed youthfulness. And if you've ever seen a picture of Cardinal Bergoglio before he was made Pope and Pope Francis after he was Pope, you might actually get confused because the older image is often Cardinal Bergoglio, but the young Bergoglio is Pope Francis. You can even see it in the pictures that there was a renewed youthfulness. St. John Paul II said that one of the things he loved about World Youth Day was that it allowed him to draw closer to the young and they made him feel young. And that is one, and you can see that whenever you see John Paul II, I had the I had the benefit to see John Paul II at his last World Youth Day in Toronto, Canada. And this was where his Parkinson's was really impacting him and he wasn't able to move. I remember the joy that was in his spirit when he was in Toronto. He was dancing around as much as his body would allow because he was youthful again. And that gave him energy. That gave him energy to make it through two, for, for three more years of his papacy. I have to believe that, that many of his engagements with the young helped Cardinal Voit, uh, you know, Carol Wojtyla and Pope John Paul II remain young eternally. Um, and so uh, that is kind of the joy that we kind of see in these Holy Fathers. Um, and, uh, and so that's something that we're also encouraged to do as well. And finally, uh, in terms of hovenus, in terms of the juventud, uh, those of us who are no longer young need to find ways of keeping close to the voices and concerns of young people. So first of all, we talked about young people, that the actual 16 to 29 year olds that they were talking about, or perhaps the teens and the 20s and the 30 somethings that we minister to. We talked about us being youthful again, but then we also have to draw close to each other because the church needs to make a commitment to accompany and to train consecrated persons and lay people, male and female, to accompany young people. So this accompaniment of the young, essentially Christus Vivit is a document that really gives us a very good understanding of what accompaniment means. It's drawing these people together in this youthful, energetic journey together. So uh, that is what, when he's speaking about young people, that is what's going on. So in a sense, Christus Vivit reframes the roles of young people in our church. And there's three ways that I would like to share that, that we have, how are we reframing the role that young people have in our church? First, he calls them the now of God. Second, they are companions on the path. 
third, they are protagonists on a mission. I'm going to get into what that means in a second and what the implications are for us as a church. So let me talk about the now of God. It's a great phrase that we, we hear in Pope Francis. Um, for many people who work with young people, one of the things that we've said for years, and it's wonderful to see a Holy Father say this as well, you are not just the future of the church, you are the present of the church. And Pope Francis's way of saying that is you are the now of God. It, it, young people are not about to do something, they are doing something, the present tense. They are impacting the church. They not, they, you know, we keep saying, I wonder what our future leaders will be. That's kind of like, stop saying that. What are the, what, how are they now in the church? What is their now? Um, one of the things he says in Christus Vivid is we cannot just say that young people are the future of our world. They are its present. Even now they are helping to enrich it. Young people are no longer children. And I think that's a key thing for us to keep in mind because I think oftentimes we juvenilize young people, and I mean all young people. Um, you know, we, there's this notion of treating the 25-year-old, the 30-year-old, even the 39-year-old at the other end of what we call young adults in the United States, we still treat them often like children. And so there's this challenge. They are no longer children. They are a, a very distinct. Yet times are changing. Oh, if Pope Francis, Pope Francis wrote Christus Vivit pre-COVID. If only he knew how oh, incredibly the times are changing. And so they're leading us to ask, what are today's young people really like? What is going on in their lives? I was um, one of the parts of the synodal process that to me was most impactful was the fact that they spent that first year and a half listening to what is where what are young people really like and what is going on in their lives so the question of you know young people what is happening with, with your world um so there was a lot of listening that was going on uh through the the, the online survey that was done by the vatican through uh, the sociological data they asked those questions ministers they asked ministers what's going on with the young people in your ministries the priest in a gap they asked the young people directly what is going on in your lives and what they heard from from the young people was incredibly impactful um in christus vivit in the third chapter of christus vivit you will find a little bit of a um of an overview of what they had heard um you will find some of the issues that really resonated with pope francis he speaks about young people and their role in the abuse process. He speaks about young people in their in their in the impact that poverty is having on their lives. Uh, he speaks of the the digital aspect that you know that came up a lot. I know that even in the studies that were the, the surveys and conversations and consultations that were done here in the United States, the diocese, we heard a lot about the digital continent. We heard a lot about the fact that young people are overwhelmed. Um, so that's the thing. That's the one of the first steps that we have to take is if young people are the now of God, we have to thus ask what is going on in their lives. And I, let's just do that right now. What's going on in their lives right now? Uh, just this uh, just this week, uh, an article here: Why 32% of young adults are vulnerable to severe COVID-19 coronavirus infections. That's what's going on in their lives right now that they are no longer just the, uh, you know, watching on the sidelines, but that they themselves are part that we've discovered, they are susceptible to COVID-19. What else are we hearing? Uh, we're hearing that some young people fear social isolation more than COVID-19. Uh, we talk about the once in future uh, crisis of loneliness in young people, uh, loneliness and social isolation uh, among young people are at threatening levels before COVID-19. Loneliness and isolation, I have we've been studying that for a number of years. And then we have a pandemic and we're told, we're telling every young person, stay inside and socially distance yourselves. The psychological impact on the world's loneliest generation is incredible. And what impact will months and months of isolation have on a generation that has already felt isolated, that has already, that mental health issues are on the rise amongst young people like never before. 
that was the epidemic before the pandemic, was the epidemic of mental health. That's what was going on. And now this has simply exacerbated it because of the fact like, so COVID, the medical issues, there's that, and then there's the issue of isolation. So that's what's going on in their lives right now. That's how this impacts. And then the economic impact. Um, one of the things in this, uh, this study said that it's the younger generations, millennials and Gen Z, that will likely bear the greatest financial brunt of this economic recession. So added to social isolation, added to the fact that they might, they might get the disease, added to the fact that their grandparents are dying, that these wisdom figures in their lives are, are leaving them. They are also, the economic impact on young people is significant. That is what's going on with their lives. So for many young people today, that is one of the things that, this is the now of God. This is what's going on in their lives right now. And so as a church, what are our implications? I think that the, what Pope Francis is really pointing us to in Christus Vivid is that because they are the now of God, we as a church then, we must start with a pastoral approach. Pastoral approaches are one of the things we sometimes uh, don't necessarily always get to, but this became clear in the synodal process that the pastoral nature of the church needs to take much more precedence than it did before. We've often, we teach our young people, we serve our young people, we challenge our young people, we socialize with our young people in our communities. But do we pastorally care for our young people? That's a question we, we have to ask ourselves. That's a, that's a sobering question. Um, in Christus Vivid, he, he kind of challenges us to think through that. He says, again, and this is in this chapter three, which really is a lot of the listening of the now that's happening. May we never fail to weep before these tragedies of our young. So as a church, how can we be aware of and concerned uh, of the realities that are facing young people? Or, are, you know, when we think of pastoral care in our parishes and our diocese, we often think of pastoral care related to the elderly and the sick. We don't often think of a 25-year-old and think of pastoral care. But yet, because of the rise of mental health issues, because of these economic issues, because of the health issues that are impacting our young people today, how can we not be weeping for the tragedies of our young? The synodal process brought this out. It was a shocker. I remember some of the bishops who came back each day from the synod hall, many of the things that they said that most impacted them was how much the young, young people who were also in the synod hall with them. So the bishops gathered, by the way, but there was a cohort of about 34 young adults who were sitting there right next to them, and they were in their small groups talking with the bishops, and they were giving their witness, their story, their testimony. That was one of the things that through the, synod, uh, the synodal consultations and through those personal testimonies the bishops heard every day that really moved many of them, um, that they needed to know more, more often, they needed to really learn the stories of the young people and how can they pastorally address them. Like That was really on their minds. In the document, it also says, young people experience setbacks, disappointments and, disappointments, and profoundly painful memories. So the church wants to be Jesus's instrument on this path to interior healing and peace of heart. That's ultimately the goal that Christus Vivit sets up for us. When working with young people, the, the, what was one of the things that surprised me was, I, you know, going into it, there was a question, what would be the primary thing? Where do we approach our young people? Should we strengthen our faith formation, our catechesis? And that was in there in some degree. But the first thing that came out was how first can we be, our, be the instrument of Jesus's healing and peace of heart? How can we be the church that responds to Jesus who says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. In our ministries with young people, the process. The second thing, 
young people as companions on the path. Now, when we often think of young people, we often think um, we are of this generation. We've we've passed the hurdle. You know, we've gone through our uh, our young years. Now we are helping the next generation, and we think of them as um, as we, we kind of think of a little bit of a top-down mentality. Follow along, come follow, follow me, follow me. You know, I'm I'm the Pied Piper. You follow me. Christus Vivit reframes that a little bit and says, no, the young person is not the person trailing behind your coattails. They are standing to your right and to your left. Think of the Emmaus story. We don't think of the, you know, when you think of the Emmaus story, you didn't think of Jesus at the front and the two disciples on the road to Emmaus following him, you know, trying to get in front. Now, we see, we see Jesus walking side by side. That was the imagery that was used throughout the symbol process so that young people are our companions on the path. This kind of leads from, if, if young people are the now of God, if they are fellow Catholics, fellow Christians with us, then they are companions. They are not people behind us. Um, they are there walking with us. Um, and so uh, in Christus Vivid, it says, if we journey together, young and old, we can be firmly rooted in the present, and from here, revisit the past and look to the future. Together, we can learn from one another, warm hearts, inspire minds, the light of the gospel, and lend new strength to our hands. Let us all climb aboard the same canoe and together seek a better world. I love that imagery, by the way. It was an Im actually, what's, what's, and again, part of the voice of young people, um, the, 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 the image of the canoe was actually um, a, young, some, uh, a young adult from Samoa, American Samoa, who, uh, who was at the Synod, and in his testimony to the Holy Father, uh, spoke about the image of a canoe, and that for him in the Samoa, the Samoan Islands, uh, the image of of the um, uh, the young people and the uh, and the elders are in the same canoe together. Um, the young people often are the ones rowing, while the uh, while the elders are the ones who are they they've gone this way before and they're guiding the path. So it's a mutual effort. So that's the imagery that was used. And Pope Francis actually totally steals that image and puts it in Christus Vivit. Um, so again, the voice of the young is right there in there. Um, so that's why he uses this phrase, let's all climb aboard the same canoe. Um, but again, I, the phrase that to me sticks out here is we can learn from one another. We often think, what have we to teach our young people? We talk about what can we, what can we pass on? What can we teach our young people? What we sometimes don't ask the question is, is what can I learn from young people? What can they teach me? There's a passage in Christus Vivit that Pope Francis basically is saying, um, young people help us to better understand the gospel. That's a fascinating insight. The Holy Father, the bishops of the world, what can young people help them to learn about the gospel? Aren't the bishops the ones who are going to tell you about the gospel? But, but Pope Francis says young people can, can, can tell us about the gospel. That's revolutionary to, to, to the notion of how we learn from one another. So um, one of the things that, uh, one of the part of the process that the Bishop's Conference has recently been in just that. Um, so uh, Annie mentioned in my, my biography is that I work with this national dialogue effort which was a multi-year process to listen to and learn from young people so that we can be a better church in response to that. Um, it was also a dialogue across, um, across polarized lines too. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, this might be new to some people, but the church, just like, just like the world, is a little polarized at times. There's right, there's left, there's there's conservative, there's progressive, you, you got you, whatever words you wanna use. There's, there's a lot of intensity across that. So part of the national dialogue effort that the Bishops' Conference and several national organizations were working on together is to bring unity to the field of ministry with young people. Because even in the field of youth or young adult ministries and campus ministries, there's some polarization. You're, you, you have a much more Catholic approach than me, or, 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 or you're doing this, you know, I'm, I'm a better Catholic because of this, or, or you're wrong and I'm right, and this, this method, this model works better, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of infighting sometimes, even within our ministerial communities. Perhaps in your parishes, there's even infighting there. 
in our diocese, in our country, in our in our in our church, in our world. So one of the efforts of the National Dialogue was to was to actually start thinking of how do we bring people to the same table? How do we bring this? So that the first element of unify was was intended to if we're going to better engage young people, we have to do it together. So we have to bring groups that don't normally talk to each other to come together. And then we have to engage and listen to young people because um, how, what are they saying to us? The journeying together process is, an, is a process that is kind of continuing on where the national dialogue is. The national dialogue is closing. The journeying together process is another process that we're working on at the Bishop's Conference. One of the areas that we have found um, that was most intense is we, one of the areas, you probably heard the phrase, and probably in Atlanta, you're probably well aware of this, that uh, that Sunday is still the most segregated time in the church, um, that we all go to our own respective churches. And culturally, we are not together. Um, there's, there's between people who speak Spanish as their primary language, who are bilingual, who speak English, there's that, there's that, there's that tension. There is African-American communities, and Anglo communities, there are the Asian Pacific Islanders, there's the Native American community, there's migrants and refugees and immigrants, and all of these realities, and yet at the same time in our ministries, they are incredibly segregated from one another. That's one of the learning lessons we learned through the National Dialogue, just how segregated we are. So the bishops of the Cultural Diversity Committee set forth this journeying together process, which we are about to embark on in a few weeks and continue for the next year or two. Um, and that's where we're going to have an intercultural encounter uh, for ministries with youth and young adults to start to look together, not just across ecclesial lines, but also cultural lines. We have to learn from one another. We have to be humble enough to say, I may not know. And just as a little hint as to some of the things that we learned uh, in the national dialogue process, this preliminary final report is actually, it was just relaunched this week. So I thought I would share it with you just to get a taste of one of the things in which we as a church are saying, we need to learn from young people. So we would had 18 months of conversations with young people uh, and their ministry leaders and their parents. And so after we, and, and one of the things is we had 10, we encountered 10,000 ministry leaders, young people, uh, young adults. Um, and this is what we heard from all these conversations. These are a, a quick, these are just a few points that I wanted to just even share. Young people asked us to address the authenticity gap. You speak, a, you say a good game, church, but do you really say it? You say you're pro-life, but do you really mean it? Or are you just talking in certain specific political issues? You say that you care about the young, but yet our programs are defunded. Where are, you know, so this authenticity gap is huge. And that was something that came out majorly in our conversations. By the way, the majority of the people in these conversations are the active, engaged, go weekly a church attending young people. These are not the peripheries. This is what the people in the pews are telling us, that the church has an authenticity gap. So that's something very fascinating for us. So again, that's part of the learning that we've done. There needs to be greater intergenerational dialogue and mentorship. We need accompaniment through transition moments, mental health issues, uncertainty, and fear. Even active young people struggle with the church. We need to expand our ministries, especially with young adults. There was a cry, even amongst teenagers saying, I don't know what I have to go to. Please invest in me for the future. Of course, young adults said this, but ministry leaders said this. So um, expand. In our ministry, especially as Vivid, was that there are many facets to the world of young people. It's a very complex, and you cannot, the one size does not fit all. Um, that when you engage young people, you're engaging people from all different perspectives and backgrounds and stories, and diversity is key. So, um, so these are the things that we have started to learn from our young people, um, which is very, which is incredibly exciting for us. So, what is the implications for, for this? we must take a synodal approach. Um, the synodality aspect, um, one of the things I love about the, the notion of synodality um, is that um, there is, this is one of the things we, we, we've heard. 
drawing together creates the conditions for the church to become a place of dialogue and a witness to life, life-giving fraternity. Listening makes possible an exchange of gifts in a context of empathy. Ministry has to be synodal. It should involve a journeying together, a participatory and co-responsible church, one capable of appreciating its own rich variety, and no one should be excluded or exclude themselves. So because of this dimension, because young people are um, so diverse and complex, ministry has to be synodal. We have to work together in all of this. Uh, there has to be this, this dialogue, this fraternity. The image that Pope Francis uses in Christus Vivit for synodality is that of a caravan, uh, that of the, um, uh, like the caravan that Jesus, the young person, uh, took to Jerusalem in the scriptures. Um, and in that, um, you, you find that, uh, you know, the, the caravan is, moves together, that Jesus is not just a part of the Holy Family, but that there is this larger group of people that are part of the, the, the community that journeys together. So this is part of being synodal. It means being collaborative. It means being intergenerational. How, think of that caravan that Jesus was in. It was intergenerational. Um, how are our churches intergenerational? Do, our, do all generations really feel that they have a connection to one another in our parishes? Or is it just, you know, one of the things that, that one of the parts of fallacies that we learned in Christus Vivit is that only young people can minister to other young people. Um, and uh, that's kind of sometimes one of those things like, oh, let's get somebody who's in their 20s, they can be a youth minister. Young people are craving intergenerationality. They are craving that dialogue across generations and that we need to work together. Again, if young means that we are all young again, then perhaps. Uh, we can, there isn't just the young ministering to the young, but we can really work together, climb aboard that same can, uh, canoe. And the third thing about young people, that they are protagonists on a mission. Um, and uh, one of my most favorite paragraphs in Christus Viva, and if you, if you need a paragraph that just will that just, just make you smile, I encourage you to go to paragraph 143. Um, and uh, in it, he, it's one of the most illustrative paragraphs in the document. Um, I don't actually, this isn't the whole paragraph here, actually just the first part is that paragraph. I've also combined it with another paragraph, but um, he begins by saying, dear young people, make the most of these years. Take risks, even if it means making mistakes, make a ruckus. He talks about young people, he encourages them to not be young mummies or parked cars. Um, I love the fact that the word young mummies is now in a papal document. I'm not sure. Um, it conjures up images of Halloween, perhaps. Um, but, uh, you know, talking about young people um, almost being like zombies um, going through life, like, don't do that. Don't be apathetic. Don't be, don't sit on the sidelines. Uh, this is not a, a, a spectator sport. I ask you to be protagonists of this transformation. Continue to fight apathy and offer a Christian response to the social and political troubles emerging from different parts of the world. In one way or another, fight for the common good, serve the poor, be protagonists of the revolution of charity and service. So for him, he sees young people as the people who are the, the, the leaders, the engaged people. This is why they are the now of God. In the, they, they, not only are they the now of God of what are, they, what are they experiencing, but what are they doing? So one of the things that we have seen, and, and, and this reflection to me, is you know, our recent issues re, re, regarding racial inequality um, is part of that. So, um, so you, you know, young people were at the forefront uh, of our protests. Um, they were at the forefront of advocating for justice. Young people were at the forefront of the, of, of the, the gun violence debate. The March for Our Lives was organized by young people for young people. March for Life continually is a, is a gathering that is, that is predominantly uh, overwhelmed with young people. Young people can offer a Christian response. And so this is part of the hope Pope Francis sees and the, and the encouragement to avoid this notion of apathy. 
So what are the implications of this? Knowing this, this, this is what young people are, we must take a vocational approach. And what do I mean by that? So uh, Pope Francis says in Christus Viva, it, here I would like to point out, it doesn't take much to make young people missionaries. Even those who are most frail, limited, and troubled can be missionaries in their own way. For goodness can always be shared, even if it exists alongside many limitations. Now let me pause here, because it, when talking about missionaries, we have to then go back to Evangelii Gaudium, uh, the joy of the gospel, where Pope Francis reframes what we mean by mission and evangelization. It is not just proselytization. It is not just um, uh, is not just making more Catholics, but it is about truly sharing the story. It is about engaging in the world. Um, that is what evangelization for Pope Francis is. So when he's speaking about missionaries, he's not just speaking about um, signing people up so that they'll join your church, but mission the mission that they're on. What is the mission that they are engaged in? For people who are involved with the, the, the Black Lives Matter protests, for the uh, March for Life, for the uh, March for Our Lives, that is their mission. Their mission is to bring the gospel to the social world. That is something Pope Francis speaks about. So how can we help make young people missionaries in that sense? How can we help them live up to their mission? There is also a special need, he says, to accompany young men and women who show leadership potential so they can receive training and the necessary qualifications. So if we see our young people and their mission, how can we then help them be leaders in that mission? Um, he, in the, the Synod final document kind of says, from the beginning of the synodal process, it became very clear that ministry with young people needs a vocational slant. The vocationality of ministry with young people should not be understood in an exclusive sense, meaning just a few um, you know, specific vocations that we're talking about, but in an intensive sense. Youth and young adulthood are the privileged moments for listening, for availability, and for accepting God's will. Now, of course, in our conversations on priestly and religious life vocations, we know that youth and young adulthood is a prime time for that. But uh, what about the other missions that they're called to in their life? The call, their mission for justice, their mission for engagement. One of the things we did here in the National Dialogue is that young people wish to change the world. They wish to impact the world. That is what young people want. But how is the church helping them in that? How is it being vocational by helping them respond to that mission that they are called to? What is the mission? How can we help them find that mission? And again, if that involves, if their mission is to serve the church through the ordained or consecrated life, fantastic. How can we move them that path? If their mission is to march for justice, how can we help them along that path? If their mission is to be a family and to make their family life so perfect that they can, that they are, um, they're a model to each other, they're, 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 they're a witness to the world, how can we help them along that path? Whatever young people, and sometimes young people are called to multiple things, they're called to, to marriage and family life and to the call to justice. So how can we help make both of those vocational things? He speaks in Christus Vivit about the vocation of work. So how can we help young people find meaning in their work? That is the role. So for our implications, it means that we have to be vocational. We have to help young people find mission in their lives because they are. And, and the thing is, is, that does not have to wait. It's not like vocation doesn't happen later. But how can we help them step into that mission right now? Because they are the now of God. So all of this, what does this mean for us? It is not only has it reframed the role of young people, but it has reframed our role. So we are called to be more pastoral and responsive. We are called to be more synodal and collaborative. And we are called to vocational accompaniment. And think of that vocational in the broadest sense of the term of helping them understand their baptismal call to holiness and to mission in the world. How can we accompany them? That is where our roles are reframed. So the question we ask ourselves, are we as pastoral and responsive as we ought to be with young people, with anyone? And again, if everyone, if, if, if those who are youthful, how are we being pastoral and responsive to just anyone we meet with that youthful heart? 
how are we being synodal? How are we being listening? How are we journeying with people? Are we really, or are we just, are they just ticking off a, a sacramental moment? Or are we truly going on the journey with them in a synodal fashion? How are we being collaborative with other people in the church and even outside the church? How is our ministries truly collaborative? How are we collaborative with the secular world? How are those in our communities, our neighborhoods? Are there civic organizations or secular organizations that we can collaborate with? How are we, you know, our role has to be collaborative. And then how can we be uh, accompanying of, of young people in their vocational path? So Christus Vivit really sets the foundation for all of this. The document is a beautiful explanation of that. Um, in true fashion, I have not given away all the details. You'll have to read it for yourself. Um, and so um, I, this to me though, it, in, in some total, in its nine chapters, is what it's essentially calling us to do. The last part of Christus Vivit, which by the way, again, beautiful thing and if you have a moment if you if you if you if you only have if you only have five minutes or ten minutes of your time to really dedicate to it maybe ten minutes if you have ten minutes to dedicate I would jump straight to chapter four of this document uh, which is basically Pope Francis's homily to young people on the key things that he wants every young person to know um, and again this kind of addresses and Andy this addresses your question actually about loneliness um, because I told you before, chapter three in the document is, uh, is all about um, some of the issues that were raised. So immediately following chapter three, Pope Francis, in a way, is responding to all the challenges that young people are facing. And he says, essentially at its core, I want you to know this. I want you to know that God loves you. I want you to know that Christ saves you and that Christ is alive. Those are the three things I want you to know. Now, those at first glance, you're like, okay, that's great. Christian Hallmark card greeting, God loves you, yay. But what is he essentially getting at? And this is how it breaks down. Young people often feel a sense of worthlessness. They often feel that they are not worthy and that they are insignificant in the world. So to know that the all-powerful deity that controls the universe loves them, who they are is an essential component, and we have to help convey that they are loved, that they are essentially loved by God. And because we are Christians and we follow God and we act as God would want us to act, we have to love them one by one. We have to, without judgment, love them. So that is the first truth that Francis tells them. God loves you and so do I. And I don't, and I'm not just saying it, I mean it. The second thing, Christ saves you. Oftentimes, young people think that they're going through their challenges alone. They're going through all the, that, they, that no generation before has ever suffered like me. And we all think that. We've all had those. No one suffers quite like me. But to know that Christ suffered too. He walks the cross too. You are not alone in your suffering. So first, you are worthwhile. You are, you are worth something. Secondly, you don't suffer alone. I walk the cross with you, Christ says. And then we, again, following in Christ's footsteps, we have to walk the journey with them. And the third thing, Christ is alive. What is that? That statement, we, you know, is we say that on Easter Sunday. Jesus is alive. He's risen. And why, why is it important for us to know that? Because after the cross, after the hardship, after the worst possible day of our lives, that we believe that the story of faith is that, 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 that the worst day of our life is never the last day, never the last day. The last day of our lives is the resurrection. It is the resurrection, and that is the end of the story. And so no matter how hard things look, no matter how much that you think that there is no hope, no light at the end of the tunnel, know that there is. Christ is alive, and actually he's alive in you and he exists in you. He's alive today because you possess him in your heart. And so you not only are not only not worthless, you have Christ within you. We often think of to ourselves, how can we bring Christ to young people? What we don't necessarily recognize always is that Christ is already present in young people. What we need to do is hold up a mirror to let them see that. 
and that is our journey. So when we often think about our evangelization of young adults, we think about bringing God to young people. God is there. Christ is alive and he's in them. And so our work is simply to hold up a mirror and to help them see Christ alive within them so that they truly can become the fullness of who they are. That is the message of chapter four. And I think it's a beautiful response to all the heaviness that was heard in this process. Now, hearing all of this, um, there is a lot of energy. There's a lot of like, yes, let's be, let's be youthful. Yes, let's, in, let's accompany our young people. And so Pope Francis, at the, the very, this is the last paragraph of Christus Viva. He says, my joyful hope. And again, there's that joy there, by the way, the joy of the gospel, the joy of love. These are the, these are the exhortations of Pope Francis. And again, his end here, the joyful hope is to see you keep running the race before you, outstripping those who are slow or fearful. Keep running. So he encourages young people, and actually, in a sense, he could think he's encouraging each of you to keep doing this. It can seem defeating. Oh my God, we, you know, we're losing our budgets. Oh my God, we're losing our young people. Oh my God, this work is so massive, can I do it? Keep running the race, keep running. He tells young people, and he tells you, who, by the way, if you, you who minister to young people are youthful, so you should keep running. So the church needs your momentum. It needs your intuitions. It needs your faith. We need them, he says. And when you arrive at where we have not yet reached, have the patience to wait for us. This is a beautiful image. Again, getting back to this resurrection image. Do you remember the story in the scriptures of Peter and John running to the tomb? on the day of the resurrection. If you remember the story, Peter, the slow pope, takes his sweet time getting to the tomb. John, the young person, totally outruns him, outstrips him, outstrips Peter, and goes to the tomb. But what does John do? What does John do? John does not go in. John waits for Peter, a slow, meandering Peter, to catch up. And then together, they journey together into the tomb together to see the resurrected, the empty tomb. I like to think of that Pope Francis, Peter of our times, is talking about, hey, we know you young people. We know you ministers with young people are like John. You probably in your head have arrived at where we need to be. But I ask, when you arrive where we have not yet reached, when in your mind you know where we need to go as a church, please have the patience to wait for us. And so I'm, I share this because I think this is a beautiful message on the last, the last words of Christus Vivit is to say that Pope Francis, the papacy, the bishops, your pastors, your leaders in faith, we are all working together. My work with the bishops is to help you know, we're, I walk with our bishops towards that empty tomb, towards that, 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 that goal of really having an engaged church with young people. Many of you are already there. And so I beg you on behalf of our bishops to have a way to, to, to just let's wait for each, let's be, be patient with each other. This is a long journey. It is an incredible journey. And we're working on it together. It, we have, in the synodal process, we have come so far. It is incredible to see a church talking about young people like this, really having their minds transformed, having themselves think, oh, this is, you know, that, that we, so we have gone a long way. We still have a long way to go. Have the patience to wait for one another. Last thing I say, one of the things that, and Andy can, can, can attribute, and know, know this about me, I'm a little OCD. I'm a little obsessive compulsive. So for me, when, when I read the document for the last time, or for the first time, I was a little disappointed that Pope Francis had 299 paragraphs in his document. Now, for somebody who's OCD and likes round numbers, that is infuriating. Could you not think of one more thing to say to make it an even 300? Did you have to stop at 299? But upon reflection and thinking about all this thing, and I need to be patient too, I've reflected that, you know, in a sense, each of you is paragraph 300. 300 lies with us. The reason why we need to be a little unsettled, I need to be a little unsettled, 
because I can't do it alone. The Pope can't do it alone. We have to rely on each other. And I have to rely on the good people of the Archdiocese of Atlanta to make this work. And you need to rely on one another to make it. We need to have patience with others. So you are paragraph 300. We are all paragraph 300 um, waiting to that fulfillment. Um, so uh, just one way to think about it. Um, I just want to, again, express my thanks to, uh, to Andy and to Elaine uh, for their hospitality today. Um, and I want to thank all of you for the work you're doing. Um, I can say for sure that it, I believe it gives our bishops much hope in what you are doing. So thank you for your work and know that you are being prayed for each and every day by me, by our bishops, uh, and by our Holy Father.